Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Webinar Wednesday with the IFC FinTech Hive. Today, we have um, a guest speaker, uh, Sonia, uh, who will help us explore the path to the next normal, as she calls it, and the digital transformation beyond COVID-19. In this webinar, we will explore acceleration of digital economy, local and regional versus global, and industries that are facing major disruption. Sonia is a dear friend, and she's also a transformational leader. She's a senior advisor in McKinsey & Company Middle East office. She's a transformational business and technology leader in transactional and consumer banking with 25 years of experience across Europe, Asia, and the US. Uh, Sonia, thank you for joining us today. Uh, please uh, start your presentation. Uh, after Sonia's presentation, we will be uh, answering any questions that are being submitted in the Q&A uh, section. So if you have any questions, write them as they come to your mind, and we will go through all the questions after the presentation. Thank you so much. Raja, thank you very much for this uh, great introduction. Um, welcome, everyone, uh, good afternoon in uh, this very interesting period where changes that used to take decades are actually happening during the days. Uh, subject of my presentation today is all about how digital transformation has accelerated in the last couple of weeks and in the last couple of months at an unprecedented scale. But before I, I go into that, I wanted to talk to you about COVID-19, which we need to remember that first and foremost is a global humanitarian challenge. We can see every day thousands of health professionals that are baiting the virus, putting their own lives at risk. Being already at the end of May, we can see some of the countries getting out of the crisis. Uh, we see a big progress made in Taiwan, New Zealand, Australia, Switzerland, and a few other countries. However, there are still certain countries where the number of cases is rising. So it does not look like the end is any near to all of us. And it's very much different between the countries. One thing that usually comes to my mind when I'm looking at times of change, like the one that we are currently um, subject to, I always think about Bill Gates' quote that I used to make many times during my digital transformation presentations. And it says that we always overestimate the change that will occur in the next two years and underestimate the change that will occur in the next 10. So don't let ourselves to be lulled into inaction. Many people have already seen how much changes have come about in our world in the last weeks and months. But the true change into the way we, we live, we work, we operate will come in the years to come. And you will see how much the world would change after this shocking situation that we are all subject to right now. I always said that in the last couple of years, the way we communicate, and I'm thinking about us messaging each other more than even talking to each other, commute, and here I'm talking about taxi hailing applications and consume, and uh, I'm talking about how we order the goods online, um, has changed the, the way we live. But I never thought that the crisis situation will so dramatically accelerate all of those digital channels that we already thought are part of our life, but not of everybody's life. One big thing that we have noticed in the last um, couple of months is that suddenly the digital transformation and the digital channels have reached a much wider part of our societies. A lot of people that were um, believed that people thought are not very digitally savvy, especially a little bit elder people, currently are very comfortable with using WhatsApp messaging, uh, Facebook Messenger, in order to be or Zoom, in order to be with the life with the loved ones online every day. And here, my mom, who is uh, 75 years old, who was always um, very cautious to use any digital cameras comes to mind. She's very comfortable of talking to me and watching me on video almost every day. But what are we seeing happening now? I wanted to start with a little bit of a description of the world around us. Well, 
First of all, we all see that the cross-border consumer to business transactions are very much down. We have seen in the last couple of months 35 40% drop in the flows between consumer and business. Of course, a lot of that is the subject of disruption of travel and transportation industry. We don't travel, we don't stay in the hotels anymore. We are not shopping at duty-free shops, and that has a big impact on the economy. On the other hand, people realize that they need to think markets are much closer to the way they are, because this disruption of the supply chains are having impact on everybody these days. These days, we were so much used to the idea of globalization because the world seems to be so small with hundreds of flights coming every day in and out of our airports all around the world that we never thought that one day we would need to think about a place where we can source the goods to eat, to wear, and basically to survive much closer to the place where we live. At the same time, the cross-border business-to-business transactions are also dropping. And here we see 25 to 30 percent drop all over the world, with a lot of supply chains being disrupted due to freight and transportation on hold. We see a lot of containers, empty com containers um, on the ships going all around the world, and full containers being stuck at the ports, at the harbors all over the world, because they're not there are not many ships that actually have been uh, able to take them. So this situation is being seen in many, many industries. That is actually very much underlined by interdependence between the different markets. Uh, a lot of um, ready-made goods that are being produced in the United States, for example, the, the car manufacturers, the spare parts and the components are being made in China. And the fact that different markets have a very different speed of reaction and hence recovery from the crisis is actually having a devastating effect on the supply chains. Guess what? There are many, many auto factories in the United States that have not started their production yet, where China for the last couple of weeks is already fully up and running. But there is no demand for their spare parts because the other side of the world is still very deep in the crisis. So these disruptions nobody has ever envisaged could happen at such a uh, fast a period of time. At the same time, all of us see what's, go what's happening at the security markets. Although the crisis is at full swing, uh, the virus is not over yet by any means when we observe the number of cases and the unfortunate number of deaths every day. But the markets went down 35 to 40 percent in the early weeks, uh, but they are currently in a very volatile stage. Every day we see markets going up and down, and the number of uh, transactions is enormous. There is a lot of speculation also in these markets, and hence the number of payments is going up. The retail payments and merchant services are severely impacted. I don't need to tell you, all of us know that we are spending much less. In-person sales are down by 30 to 40 percent in certain markets in the short term, and this, this data is coming from Europe in the first week after the uh, lockdown. At the same time, although we have seen an increase in online sales, they are not related to all the categories. People started buying more for, for things like um, uh, groceries, everything that we need on a daily basis, medicine, a lot of other things that we need on a daily basis as the essential goods. On the other hand, mostly luxury goods and business apparel, we don't need that anymore to go to the office or we use it very, very rarely, has dropped down a lot. Not mentioning hotels, restaurants and recreation culture that usually um, in Europe um, constitute about 30% of the household expenditure. In certain markets, they were down to 90%. By, by 90 percent. So they're down to 10 percent of the previous uh, previous spend. And I don't need to tell you that there are certain markets that rely on tourists more than the others. Thailand comes to, to mind, Egypt, which is close um, uh, here, UAE, where we, where we all live, as well as other markets like Greece, Italy, and many others, Spain. They are currently really trying to reimagine the way they are going to revive their uh, businesses as far as travel and um, 
tourists, tourism is concerned, because they have been very severely impacted in the last couple of months. The gig economy, the fintechs are suffering a lot. The investors are less willing to put a lot of money into more risky endeavors. In today's world, where a lot of fortunes, a lot of value has um, declined because of what has happened with the meltdown of the markets. So there is seen a very big flight to security, which in many cases is basically the bigger companies, the banks, the more stable uh, companies, including the online companies that are one of the very few that have seen a big increase in their value in the last uh, couple of weeks, including a lot of the messaging and video platforms. The use of cash is declining. The cash is being seen as the most non hygienic way of making a payment. And despite huge effort to sanitize cash using ozone, high temperature and um, UV rays, still people are very uncomfortable to use cash. The cash withdrawals are down by 50%. That's again, uh, European uh, statistics. Uh, not only because we are spending less, but also the, uh, because we want to use our contactless payments, our cards, we do not want to touch the banknotes anymore. And I'm just thinking about one of the conversations that I had with one of the friends from China a few years back. And he told me, um, in my case, I have not seen cash in the last seven years. And I'm just thinking whether this situation would become true for us all over the world very, very soon. At the same time, we have noticed that those companies, financial institutions, but not only them, that have been surrounded by a very rich ecosystem partners that are reaching not in, uh, outside of the country, but also inside, are actually making a lot of thrives in today's crisis environment. And the reason for that is they do not rely just on their, our, themselves, but they can also rely on others. And though, uh, those other partners that they have into their ecosystem um, are sometimes in different parts of the world. So when one part of the world is under lockdown, they can always rely on the others that are in other parts of the world. Some of them also have partners that are closer to where they are, and they are subject to the same scrutiny. So rebooting the global economy is on everybody's mind these days. After the initial shock, after the lockdown, after going through the worst situation, I'm talking Asia and I'm talking Europe, that are currently already thinking about opening up, people start thinking already about the future. What will happen about the future? After we have made sure that our people, our employees, our families are safe and secure, we already start thinking what happens next. Well, digital offering is not an option anymore. I don't need to tell you that. This is uh, so obvious to everyone. It's do or die these days. You need to be present in in the digital channels, not just to thrive, but barely to survive in this environment. But another question comes to mind. Is it going to be sustainable? Many people say that you can develop a habit and actually with digital transformation these days, it is a forced habit because we do not have any other way to do certain things, but remotely, if everything else is closed and we are forced to stay at home. But the question is, will it stay long enough that the habit that we have developed in these difficult times will stay. Can we expect that after the time of crisis, some people will go back to brown and go back to paper, or we will be able to make sure that the experience that we give to our customers would be so great that they will not, not even think about going back the old way. Banks are becoming platforms. And this is very interesting. I was talking many times about ecosystem and especially in China with a very, um, with quite a few big companies becoming platforms where people can not only do one thing, like for example, do the e-commerce transaction, but they can also make payment, they can call a doctor. So in other words, that becomes a place where people can fix majority of their life activities on one, on one, uh, in one place. And that platform thinking was not very popular outside of the Asian countries and especially China. But I tell you what, these days, what we have noticed is that many, many more banks and financial institutions are successful uh, while going beyond banking and offering other services rather than banking. And the reason for that is in the time of uncertainty and a crisis like the one that we are facing today, 
trust is becoming one of the most important features. So people are turning to the companies that they trust, also for other things, not necessarily just banking. Many people also are trying to rethink and reimagine uh, the big truth that we are living, you know, for many years at globalization was the name of the game. People were having thousands of hundreds of different suppliers all over the world in different places because the whole logistics was working so uh, smoothly that nobody ever thought it can be disrupted to such a way that it will make them think like today about seeking local providers of many components that they need in order to sustain and continue with their activities. So people used to have, you know, shared service center in one country, somewhere very far away, in many cases in Asia, or in Eastern Europe, or in many other places, and there was just one place. But with that one place shut down and was under the big scrutiny, in today's world, people are thinking about diversifying um, that global footprint into a more diverse regional one and even a local one. So the future of service, uh, of service centers is something that is uh, becoming disrupted a lot. On one hand, many, many uh, shared service centers in the matter of days went into remote work very, very fast. Of course, there were a lot of issues to be overcome, including providing security for customer data, making sure that the productivity and the fact you know, the, of the activities of people working remotely is properly monitored. But at the same time, many of the places uh, had even difficulties with putting people into homes because of some disruption in travel and and the fact that many people were locked down at home without the possibility to even go to the office in order to have the computer or any other device that will connect them remotely so many people are thinking these days that we should have a backup and the whole business uh, continuity plans are being reimagined again on how we can in the matter of hours and be able not only to provide the services remotely, but also be able to provide them from different places in the world. Interestingly enough, this is also a time when many people and many businesses would need help in order to survive. Not because of their fault, they are unable to continue their business. I'm looking at the restaurants, hotels, the airlines. It is not their fault that they cannot continue with their services. And Many governments are coming with uh, the help programs that need to be distributed. The help is currently being distributed both to the companies as well as to the individuals. But guess what? In many situations, the individuals that are subject to the help that they uh, are able to receive, they do not have bank accounts. So this is again a time where for creativity, for banks and other institutions, the government institutions, to use other ways for identifying the beneficiaries of such help using some very creative ways, sending the money to the mobile phone numbers, email addresses, or national IDs. In the past, it was not really possible. The prepaid card was usually the, the ultimate innovation that we were experiencing. But in today's world, we are actually seeing much more. And strangely enough, the countries that we used to have a lot of creativity along those lines, like Africa, China, and India, will prove their supremacy in actually providing those services um, to the most needed and, in many cases, unbanked society very fast, because they already figured out the ways to deliver money and enable withdrawals using QR codes, um, using biometric, like in India, with the other card and the and the thing and the and the fingerprint that can be used for authentication so this is quite interesting that now the more developed countries that in many uh, circumstances were all, always and still very deeply in checks and cash they're actually now looking at the developing markets like china india and africa uh, southeast asia many other countries that actually developed the very new innovative ways of um, putting and pushing the money through the system without having necessarily a bank account for the unbanked society. So that's an interesting development as well. When people say that we will never be to the same cash levels as we were in the past, um, we are also thinking already about repurposing the ATM networks. Think about the number of ATMs that are there in the world. There's like thousands of them. You see the ATM on every corner in each of the bank branch. 
So people are already thinking about the rev purposing, reimagining the ATMs in a completely new way. Um, ATMs in the future will be helping us opening in accounts online. They will verify our uh, IDs, but also they will be uh, used for delivery of public documents. There's a very high level of security on our ATMs, and hence um, using the, the, the card number and the PIN, we can actually authenticate ourselves, not just to withdraw cash, but actually have access to many other secured services that can be put on the ATMs. What I also found fascinating is being part of the banks for, as uh, Raja has mentioned, for over 25 years, I remember um, the big conviction of many of the relationship managers that they were dealing with um, wealth management products and with the more affluent customers, that it is not possible to advise uh, the customer and sell the investment products uh, using online channels or video. But guess what? In today's world, there is no other alternative. Uh, many of our relationship managers cannot meet with the clients. So the accelerated pace of going into online meetings, into video chats with the customers that actually are able to rebalance their portfolio using digital channels and can have a conversation with the relationship man manager is actually breaking a lot of the uh, old thinking that some things are just not possible. They are possible when we do not have any other option. And once the, the customers get comfortable with that, they would like to continue this way. Business travel will be impacted. And I don't need to tell you because we are all grounded in our countries for not only weeks, but months right now. Um, we could not imagine even in our company McKinsey that we can spend a week without being at the customer site three to four days. But in today's world, we are spending eight, 10 hours sometimes on Zoom every day with our um, clients. And it's not just a, a conversation, which is usually quite easy, or a presentation like this one, but also running workshops that um, require a lot of engagement on the people. We figured out that it actually can work. Although I must tell you that in the future, the way we see it is not necessarily going to be online uh, only. We believe there is going to be a hybrid between in-person meetings that are very important to build the relationship and the trust and um, discuss a lot of things that sometimes it's quite difficult to, to discuss directly online, but also engage people on the ground. So there is going to be a hybrid, but we are sure that the business travel is going to be impacted to a large extent. Many people are saying we will not go back to what um, we used to in the past, but the world is going to change. The same thing is related to digital documents, signing and authorization. Um, I see a lot of acceleration in the field of digital identity, uh, where we really need to have something that is proving us, being us in the, in the digital world, in order to be able to sign the digital uh, the documents in a digital way, in a safe and secure manner. And also we are going into many many ways into notarization of the documents that we need to provide both to the government agencies, to the banks and many other places. Working out of home um, versus collaborating workspaces. We have seen uh, with many companies in the last couple of years a boom of the co-working spaces. Um, we had that not only at uh, places like Facebook and Google that probably have uh, pioneered the way of working, but we've seen the co-working spaces for fintech companies. Uh, we've seen them being developed in banks and so, and so forth. Many people believe that the agile way of working is actually not possible without being co-located and being um, at the same place at the same time because the level of collaboration is so high. I was one of the of the people who were always saying that if not our collocation with our technology and digital team at one of my endeavors when I was setting up a digital bank, the success would never come. But again, my own way of thinking got disrupted when I saw that with the new tools that are available online, and I'm not only talking um, Zoom or MS Teams and many, many other platforms that we are using every day, but also the collaborative um, whiteboarding uh, tools that we can use that actually make the agile delivery possible. And of course, there is nothing like going together with the team for a drink. We are now doing the, uh, the virtual uh, drinks and the virtual meetings uh, uh, online in order to 
feel like a team together. Um, so I believe that there will be a time that again we will have a hybrid mode when we will spend a little bit of time being together in person with the team. But I also believe that a lot of the activities that used to happen in the physical space will now happen also in the digital space. So again, I think we are moving to a hybrid situation. That of course will have a huge impact on commercial real estate. Uh, I have already spoken with a few clients, also colleagues, friends from Poland, from many, many other countries in Asia, Europe, in the United States, that are telling me that the companies that were thinking about refurbishing their workspaces, extending their um, commercial um, office spaces, are having very hard second thoughts whether they would like to pursue it. Because they have realized that now having 100% of their workforce online actually did not impact the productivity as much as they thought. Of course, in a prolonged way of staying at home and not being able to even go outside, it has an, a negative impact on people's well-being, especially uh, on the mental health. But at the same time, people are now thinking that maybe five days a week with a three-hour commuting, as I've seen in many places that I work in the world, is not worth anymore. Uh, to have such a waste of time uh, of actually commuting every day and maybe two days at, uh, at the office and three days working out of home would be a new way that people will pursue their endeavors going forward. That will have a very big effect on the size of our offices in the way we organize ourselves when we are coming to the office, how we handle the whole logistics. So it's a very interesting subject. So watch that space. So different times will become a new normal. You know, many people are telling me, well, we've closed the branches, or we have actually de decreased the number of branches that our services are available. And guess what? Vast majority of our clients and customers went online. So we are really thinking very hard whether we need the hundreds of thousands in certain cases of branches anymore. Maybe we, we just want to have a fraction of them because we can still be very successful with a less number of branches and promoting the digital channels. I've told you about cash, but contactless and online payments will become the new standards. I cannot imagine that people would really love to go back to the branches and fill in the documents and make the payments once they got used to making it online. Having said all that and, and, and being quite impressed with the, with the pace of acceleration of the digital channels, I always need to, to say about um, the word of caution that is related to the trend. Increased use of data for fraud protect, protection and social monitoring is the new trend that is coming. With the increased number of people going into digital channels, many of them inexperienced, many of them doing it for the first time, many of them having no choice but trying it without having a lot of experience is leading to a big vulnerability against fraud and, and, and is increasing the importance of cybersecurity. So if I were to talk about um, an industry and a trend that I'm going to see in the next uh, uh, months and years to come is a big investment in cybersecurity and fraud protection that is related to digital channels as well as education. Every day I'm getting a lot of different messages through SMS, through email, from many of my banks that I hold my accounts telling me don't react to that, we would never ask you for that, we would never ask you to click on that because they see already an increased activity of the fraudsters to take advantage of the fact that, there's, that there is no other way but digital this way and many people are doing it for the first time and hence they're much more prone to actually be subject to such a fraud. I have also seen that there is a big acceleration in the way regulators start looking at digital uh, transformation, digital channels, digitizing a lot of the flows and also changing the regulations that they thought will take years before they become effective. Uh, this situation has forced a lot of very positive, very progressive thinking among the regulators all over the world. They are learning from each other. They're looking at the forefront um, economies that made uh, digital being the next normal. And here, you know, it comes to mind Singapore, um, China, India to a large extent, a lot of the regulations, but European Union that are allowing a lot of the activities uh, that are done uh, by the customers of the banks in a digital way. They are copying the best practice solutions and they are implementing them in their countries. 
So if I were to summarize uh, my presentation, I just wanted to leave you with a couple of thoughts. Well, the first thing I wanted to tell you, if you believe after that crisis, we are going to go back to where we were, I don't believe it will ever happen. The world will never be the same again. The world before the coronavirus um, that we know and we still remember will never come back. Uh, people are saying about uh, new normal, and we would like to name the new reality, not being the new normal, but being the next normal, moving to a new way of doing things, being much more cautious about our health, and a lot of the things that we never thought about are now best becoming very important and are guiding the way we behave and we are running our business. The rapid acceleration of digital economy is coming without saying. One thing that we need to remember is how sustainable are some of the solutions that we put in place in a hurry and whether we should improve them to really um, give our customers uh, the best uh, experience. The whole thinking about local and regional versus global. Uh, globalization uh, was going without saying it's something that everybody thought is a standard. There is no way back. In this case, people are thinking maybe we should diversify and have a little bit of a regional and local presence as well. The ways of working are, have reimagined. After the first um, very difficult couple of weeks, people adjusted and they started enjoying. But at the same time, after the next couple of weeks and even months, people are getting a little bit tired and, as they are saying, zoomed out. So we really need to think what is the next normal to that. Are we going to have a certain hybrid, something that is in between being always online versus being in person? Maybe there is um, a, a middle ground between the two. Business travel, commercial real estate are subject to major disruption. There is no doubt about that. We will never be, I believe, going for a meeting for half an hour into the other part of the world in order to come back with another flight 12 hours. Um, each way, um, and also we will start um, uh, really um, uh, rethinking our commuting, uh, sometimes a very long one in order to go to work, spend a few hours and come back, while we can be much more productive sitting at home and connecting online with many of our partners. So again, I don't see this being black and white, but I see quite a major disruption there. And then last but not least, that needs enabled by international and local regulatory frameworks with the regulators being at the forefront of the changes so all of that can be compliant with the recent legal and regulatory trend. With that, uh, I want to thank you very much for your attention and I'm very open for your Thank you, Sonia. Uh, that was very insightful and there are two comments that I would like to add here before we move to questions. First of all, um, as we most of us are here in the UAE, we've seen how fast the UAE government has responded to this pandemic. We've seen the efforts that has been invested in by all of the uh, government authorities to enable this remote working, digital signatures, transactions online, payments online. It, we did not stop working. So it was really easy. And can you imagine how much paper we've saved and have not touched since we have been in lockdown. So um, I truly admire the vision of the leadership that have seen a prioritized digitization and innovation a long time ago and have enabled the government with all of the entities to support that transformation. And then going back to the um, financial services related points that you have highlighted. Last uh, Wednesday, we hosted a webinar where we spoke about the top uh, fintech uh, trends amid the pandemic. And as you have said, um, we've identified and working very closely with our partners to find startups that are going to solve these problems, specifically in areas of digital and branchless uh, banking, as I, I will not go to the bank anymore because I can do most of my work from home right now and that's con that consumer behavior has already shifted and it's not going back to what it was before. Data analytics and uh, machine learning enabled insurance management that has um, created an opportunity for everyone to analyze and acquire insurance services online. Tech enabled digital lending, there's a lot of lending and financing options that are required right now and through uh, digital platforms should be available to uh, 
uh, these parties. Digital payments, cashless, contactless, nobody wants to touch the cash and everyone uh, needs that as a necessity and not an option, as you said. AI-powered uh, RegTech solutions are very important and data analytics-based wealth advisory. So for FinTech Hive, we continue to scout for startups that are um, uh, developing or uh, growing in these areas. And we would love to see your applications come through our uh, website uh, for our uh, fourth cohort, which is uh, launching um, uh, end of this year. With that, I would like to move to Shireen to um, uh, look at the questions that came through. Super, thank you, Raja. Uh, thank you, Sonia, for the very insightful presentation. Um, I see that a lot of the audience members have already found the questions button, and actually questions were coming through as you were presenting. Uh, so we'll start with those, but for those of you who have not had the chance to send in a question yet, the way you do so is by accessing a toolbar. You'll find it on the right-hand side of the screen with a question uh, mark bubble. You insert your question. We see it in the back end, and I'll be reading your questions out to either Sonia or Reja, depending on the questions, and we'll do the Q&A up until the hour. So, Sonia, let me start with the first question that came in from Adam. Do you think that this different speed can cause a new market war? If new companies see a chance to gain market share against competition whilst in lockdown? Interesting question. Um, the, you know, the, the big question mark that I currently have is that how much this um, the, the delay or the different types of reaction that is also related to the different times the virus has spread um, all over the world um, will uh, continue and will actually progress for a longer time. I'm, I'm looking very closely at the statistics every day. And one thing that I have noticed is that there are very different uh, uh, shapes of the curve for different countries. Uh, one thing that is very similar uh, between the country like my mine, which is Poland and UAE, is that in certain countries they, there's like a long wave. Um, uh, you know, it, it goes up um, uh, quite fast, but then it stays at a certain level. It's not going up, but it's somewhere at the same level, and it's very difficult to say how how fast it will it will finish. There are certain countries that went uh, through a very sharp, uh, like a, 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 a I would say inverted V shape, like China, for example, or even. Italy, that had a very fast increase in the cases, and then they started sharply going down, especially in the last couple of weeks. So, um, by answering the question, um, to tell you the truth, I don't know because the the, the fact that we are having a different um, timing of the countries coming back is not that um, obvious. So it's very difficult even to um, to say today whether or or we will have a prolonged situation in, say, Middle East or US versus um, Asia is coming back because we also see some second waves. So um, I'm sure that there will be companies that would be um, taking an advantage of, of the fact that um, there is opportunities for digital more because of people being locked down in different countries. But I don't see this as, um, as a war between the markets because, um, interestingly, um, in some of the markets that under the lockdown, uh, like for example, United States, the, um, the places where the most digital companies emerged, like Google, Amazon, Facebook, and Zoom, for example. Uh, so, and they're under the lockdown. So, it's not necessarily that the companies are emerging in the countries that are more open. And uh, it's sometimes actually um, some historical, I'll see historical situations, the funding that they are getting and so, and so forth. So uh, I don't see a direct correlation between that, but I see a correlation of acceleration of digital channels in that period. Super. Sonia, another question perhaps addressed to you. With the supply chain impacted severely, what do you think will happen in Q2? results from banks, mainly consumer business and SME business, when they declare financial quarterly results in July and August? You know, it, difficult to say, of course, but we are already hearing about quite an, a big impact on GDP in the second quarter. And uh, as you might imagine, the GDP impact has a direct impact on the bank's results because then the amount of money that is on one hand flowing to the bank accounts and then um, uh, flowing out because of payments and many other economic activity would be suppressed because of this 
situation that we are currently at and the big lockdown. On the other hand, when we are talking to the banks, we are currently um, mostly engaged in the in the conversation about liquidity losses and and cost cutting because of the of the decreased um, volumes that they see people not coming to the branches people not really engaging in new activities because of the uncertainty and risk of the situation so the only thing that i can say i do not expect a growth for the second quarter in a situation that uh, one one Part of the global and and there was also a moment one one half of the global population was in at home and many businesses were severely impacted. Super. Um, the next question is: flow of documents is a major challenge in the current situation and global trade and trade finance. What is your take on the use of blockchain? As you mentioned, trust. And this question is from Manoj. So this, this is a question that I'm answering uh, quite a lot. Um, you know, blockchain um, has become famous, yes, because it's not a new phenomenon because of Bitcoin and all the cryptocurrencies. Um, as I always say, for all the good and bad reasons. Uh, for the uh, bad reasons, because many people um, uh, currently associate blockchain with cryptocurrencies, while the number of different applications is much wider. Uh, good because people got aware about the the blockchain as the as new technology um, and there are a lot of applications being developed right now the truth is um, it has not become a big commercial success yet but i believe actually the, the coronavirus situation is a very good um, a stimulator for uh, any technology that is increasing the the security of the flows and it's also allowing to um, have the records in the system in the immutable type of the way. Because one of the big fears of today's world is when we are going into digital, sharing documents, uh, signing documents, you know, sending and so on, are they genuine? So I believe that there is, uh, especially for the applications of blockchain that are dealing with digital identity, uh, durable media, where you know a lot of uh, notarized documents, deeds of property, um, uh, our documents, certificates of, of our education and many, many other things. I believe that there is going to be an increased usage uh, of that technology, which is subject to constant change. One thing that we have noticed recently is also that um, blockchain is becoming a service. Many big companies, uh, big providers of software, for banks and many other institutions are actually incorporating blockchain solutions into their core offering. All right. The next question is, um, what are your thoughts on the role? Oops, sorry. I lost the question. My mistake. <laughs> what are your thoughts on the role of the eight, of ATM financing in best shaping and changing dynamics of ATM networks post COVID-19? More specifically, what can be done better here in the Middle East? How can we best integrate data analytics to ATM performance management? And what are the key differentiators that, that can arise in the new ATM business model? And this is from someone named Vidor. I, I understand the I understand the question. Can we ask the participants to to raise their hand and, and just explain a little bit? What, because I don't understand the the connection between financing of the ATMs and then increasing the functionality. Can we can we have the participants uh, just explain? There's no hand raising uh, option on GoToWebinar. Ah, there's no. Uh, okay, can 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 you read the beginning of the question again? Sure. What are your thoughts on the role of ATM financing in best shaping the changing dynamics of ATM networks post COVID-19? I think Sonia, this is very close to what you have said, the repurposing of the ATM machines instead of just because taking the cash out. About, you know, putting, yeah. uh, putting money into, into, into buying of the ATMs because that's for me financing, but maybe, maybe it's a little bit different. So, you know, uh, I believe that as I said, yes, the, the whole ATM game um, is going to be much more robust than it was before. And like we, you know, we, we used to, we used we use ATMs only for cash withdrawals. Then we had the cash deposits, and many companies are also allowing us to to pay the bills. I believe that one of the big things that ATMs would uh, be able to do 
to use it for cross sales using digital channels for the people who are getting a little bit more comfortable uh, using uh, the unmanned channels. I also know about certain situations when there are video um, uh, conferences that are enabled by, uh, by via the ATM, so we can actually get help and get advice um, using the, the ATM uh, screen if we do not access to our own immediately. So I see a lot of movement there. Um, it is very difficult, you know, when you invest so much money into the ATMs to just get rid of the machines. So I think there is going to be a lot of creativity that will go into repurposing them. All right. The next question is also in the realm of retail banking, and this is from Azra. The question is, how do you see the trend in closing branches in European banking markets, and how fast does it go? Well, I, I tell you, this is a very, <laughs> again, a, a very interesting question because it is, it is different market by market. There are certain countries that already embarked on um, almost fully digital uh, ways of servicing their uh, customers in Sweden and the Scandinavian countries um, are leading the way. For many years, people were not going to the branches anymore there. They were just comfortable doing it out of home. I'm not sure is it because of the weather and being very dark for during the most time of the year. So people prefer, you know, doing stuff out of home. Um, I don't know. Um, in other countries, it also depends on the country. In my country, for example, in, in Poland, um, there has been a big acceleration of digital and the number of branches has decreased substantially over the last couple of years, also because of the consolidation of the banks. So that was another trend. Um, with the rise of the neobank, where many people realize that they can do a lot of the transactions online without the necessity to actually going to their own bank, um, the number of transactions in the branches has decreased. So I see as an ongoing type of a trend, um, decreasing the number of uh, branches as such, but also reimagining their uh, role. Because in many cases, um, the, the banks also want to keep the branches because they are like a living banners of advertising of their name and their brand name. So people see that the bank exists because there is a branch with the, with the logo. So I think um, that trend will, will stay. But there will become more uh, places of um, advice uh, and relationship building rather than doing the simple transactions that can be done much faster and easier online. So I think the number will decrease over time, but also the purpose of the branches will change. Super. Um, the other question is regarding retail banking as well. And it says, with payments remittance and remittances being commoditized, will we see greater divergence between transactional and, and relationship banking? Very interesting. And uh, and again, there are many many different ways of of looking at the at the trends. Um, with the big tech companies uh, announcing uh, their plans to go into the payment space, like Facebook talking about uh, the possibility to send payments um, through Facebook Messenger that they are testing in, in a couple of countries, uh, WhatsApp that has opened up their APIs in, um, in India, uh, um, companies um, that are very famous these days for remittances and for FX that are doing it in a very in a very simple way uh, may suggest that uh, there would be quite a, a number of, of customers that would like to go um, beyond uh, banking and use those very simple solutions um, in order to uh, to uh, affect the very, very simple transaction remittances payments effects uh, while the bank being the, the the place of trust for over 700 years uh, would for sure uh, remain in the foreseeable future a place where we keep um, the majority of our wealth. Many people are telling me I will trust uh, an, uh, a company outside of the bank to spend small amount of money, but not necessarily keep my life savings. Um, and um, and I believe that there are two models. Yes, one model is that the banks will actually give away uh, those um, hygiene, hygiene type of transactions, uh, those that we are doing every day to the startup 
and uh, very efficient big tech companies that can take it over while they will remain with their advisory uh, and investment services um, uh, to their customers with more um, uh, more uh, difficult and more complicated transactions. Uh, the other school of thought is that the banks will adapt and they will actually integrate a lot of those solutions into their own uh, platforms and will be as competitive as the big tech and fintech companies and and there will be there's going to be a level playing field of competition between the two great i forgot to mention that that question was submitted by salt um next question is from rajanish he's actually sent a three-part question but i'm going to pick one um any possibility for digital currency to overrule retail banking if the scenario continues Interesting question again. Um, you know, we've seen this digital currency um, being on a, you know, on a high, in a way, trend for the last uh, couple of years, up and down, by the way, uh, depending on the uh, on the situation. Uh, one thing that I see a trend already, which I, I believe it's going to be more sustainable. Uh, there are a lot of uh, different jurisdictions and governments that are thinking about putting their own currency into the digital space. But the difference between uh, the cryptocurrencies that in many cases are not backed by, by uh, any of the government uh, agencies or central bank, um, those cryptocurrencies uh, can be used anywhere, but they are backed by the, by the monetary uh, policy of the, of the country. So I've seen that happening in Singapore with ESGD. There was a big, uh, there was a big initiative by the central bank and many other countries that are currently looking about putting their own currency into the Space. Super. Um, the next question is, um, and that's actually for either you, Sonia, or Reggie to answer, it would be applicable. If you would give one advice to a traditional bank which is trying to transform itself, what would it be? And this question is submitted by V. Reggie, like to go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> no, never. <laughs> <laughs> now or never, as you said, Sonia, in the beginning, digital is not an option anymore. And um, I think these uh, circumstances, although it was a joke uh, going around that COVID-19 has accelerated the digital transformation across all uh, organizations, it has just proven that it's out there. And whoever or whichever financial institution that does not have these offerings digital is already losing on the existing consumer and the future consumer. So it is a necessity to survival, I would say. So building on what Raja just said, I would I would add um, forget about banking, think about customers. Very interesting. That's the, um, that's the advice the I would give everyone. <laughs> oh go on, sorry. No, I said that, that would be the advice that I would give everyone. Forget banking, think about your customers. <laughs> <laughs> All industries. Um, in the interest of time, ladies, thank you very much for taking the Q&A. And just so you know, in the back end, I see lots of people sending messages saying, thank you for the webinar. Some people have been asking, uh, can we get more information? Uh, please do reach out to either us or Sonia. Fintech Hive is reachable at admin at fintechhive.ae. Um, I apologize if you weren't able to get to your question question unfortunately well fortunately we had lots of people attend and lots of queries come in uh, so thank you for your time and if you can uh, share any closing remarks that would be wonderful um, so I just wanted to say thank you very much for the FinTech Hive for this uh, great invitation it's always a pleasure and uh, to be able to share the thoughts and answer the questions of, of the people uh, I'm looking forward to the 2nd of June uh, being part of the FinTech Hive uh, challenge of social distancing and uh, mentoring and reviewing the startups that have applied. On the 2nd of June at 12 noon Dubai time, we've got um, a demo day uh, that all of us uh, are going to be present. So I'm cordially and warmly inviting you to come over to look at some of the amazing, amazing really solutions that the um, FinTech and the startup companies, not just FinTech companies have come up with in order to deliver solutions that will be very helpful um, to deal with the virus. Thank you, Sonia, so much. I would like to thank everyone for joining us today. Please stay in touch. We have many webinars uh, 
uh, being uh, arranged right now as we have seen a lot of interest from the community to engage with the fintech hive and our network of experts uh, we will have a couple of sessions coming up uh, on regulatory framework and on some innovation uh, uh, trends in COVID-19. Uh, as Sonia mentioned, we will have the demo day for the social distancing challenge on the 2nd of June at 12 o'clock. So please uh, sign up to uh, join us on the uh, virtual demo day. And as I said at the beginning, we continue to scout for our fourth cohort. So um, spread the word if you know of any uh, fintechs that are uh, fitting into our priorities for this year. Uh, connect us with them and uh, we look forward to hosting all of you in our next webinar. Thank you everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye bye.